Let's open our Bibles tonight to the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, righteousness through Jesus. Romans is talking about the fact that we all need God's righteousness because all of us are sinners. He tells us very clearly in a number of places, including in chapter 3 and verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Um, and all have sinned and come short of God's glory. The penalty for sin is death or separation, but God provides a righteousness, His righteousness, through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the question might arise, how would I avail myself of this righteousness? And chapter 10 is the most precious chapter and I think gives the clearest explanation in all the Bible of how to be saved, how to be brought into the family of God, and then once you're in the family of God, how to be preserved and have all of your needs met. Um, we're going to see in chapter 10 that righteousness comes through Jesus by faith, that's how you receive it, and then by preaching, that's how you share it with others. We're going to see that righteousness does come by faith in verses 1 through 13. We're going to learn how to exercise that faith, what God requires. And then righteousness comes by preaching as we put feet to our faith and take the good news to others, verses 14 to 21. So Romans chapter 10, righteousness through Jesus Christ. And always, as always, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share the word and to hear the word. Help us to receive it and to live by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 10, we have been talking about Israel and the fact that Israel is uh, needing salvation and for the most part has rejected salvation through God's provision. God had given Israel the promise of the Messiah, had given Israel the law of Moses, the word of God through the prophets, and yet for the most part, uh, Israel rejected the good news and even to this day uh, rejects the good news. Now, when you go to uh, Israel, you're certainly welcome as a, as a Christian and they uh, love the money and they love the business, uh, but uh, don't really... Uh, spend a lot of time trying to convert anybody. Uh, you won't get the negative reception you do in Islamic countries, but you don't get much of a positive reception either. And uh, if you work over in Israel, uh, it's not advisable to talk much about Jesus uh, there. They just do not really want to hear it. Um, but we still have the responsibility to pray for Israel. We have the responsibility to share our faith with individual Jews and Gentiles. And in my own family, we had my stepdad, who was an Orthodox Jew by uh, training and through birth uh, to become a believer and eventually a pastor in this church. So there are Jews who do come to the Lord, and we're grateful for that. We're going to see in the book of Ephesians, however, that God doesn't see any difference now between Jew and Gentile. The Jews had the opportunity to receive the gospel when they stoned Stephen uh, as that martyr that was so precious in God's sight. Then God turned from Israel and said, now I'm dealing with the individual Jews and Gentiles in what I call the church. One day, God will again deal with this Israel, the nation of Israel, in the tribulation after the church is taken out of the way in the rapture, put her through the fire of affliction, the wrath of Jesus, the wrath of Satan, the wrath of the Antichrist. And for those who survive all of that and turn to Christ, they'll be allowed into his kingdom. He will come back with his saints and reign in Israel in Jerusalem there in the temple. Meanwhile, though, uh, Paul is concerned because he wishes, and we saw this last week, he would trade places with them. Uh, chapter 9, he says, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. His heart breaks for his Jewish brethren who do not know the Lord. 
And I've known the Lord now for close to 40 years. And hardly a day goes by, but my heart breaks for my, my stepsisters. They're my legal stepsisters who are Jewish and do not receive the Lord. And I would do anything I could to bring them to Christ. Uh, but we have to continue to pray. I know how Paul feels. And you have loved ones. Maybe they're not Jewish, but you have loved ones who are not receiving Christ. And you know how he feels. And you do anything you could to see them come to the Lord. Well, that brings him to the topic of how do you come to the Lord? And he makes it very clear in tonight's message. Chapter 10 of Romans begins in verse 1 as he talks about righteousness coming by faith. And it's a righteousness which is not of one's own making or one's own choosing. It is the righteousness that God provides through Jesus Christ. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Couldn't be any clearer than that. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. There it is in a nutshell. That's the problem with Israel. That's the problem with all unbelievers. Most people in this world are seeking a righteousness. Some don't believe in a hereafter. Some believe there is a hereafter. But most people are either of desire or because of penalties and discipline trying to do right. But the question is, what is the righteousness that God requires? And I mentioned the world population of 7 billion people. Only 2 billion even claim to be Christians. And estimates are that maybe the actual percentage of those 2 billion is something under 10% who really have a personal faith in Jesus Christ as their righteousness. So 5 billion plus don't even claim Jesus Christ as the means for righteousness. But they're in many cases very, very zealous. They have their prayers, they have their books, they have their rituals, they have their garb, they have all sorts of ways of expressing what they believe to be righteousness. And then many of them are just trying to do right every day, do more right than wrong, hoping that at the end of the day the right outweighs the wrong. And maybe that's righteousness in their minds. But it's not according to the knowledge, the knowledge of God's revelation through Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 1 again, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. The word saved there is the Greek word soteria, which has to do with salvation, being born again, brought into the family of God. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. I used to live in a very Jewish neighborhood in Albany, and it was very, very close to the couple of synagogues, and that's why it was so populated, because Orthodox Jews were attracted to that area because they could walk to the synagogue on Saturday as they kept the Sabbath. And the law that they had was, and still do, that you cannot walk more than three quarters of a mile to the place of worship on the Sabbath. And our area was less than three quarters of a mile. And so many of them would have their particular garb and in many cases the black uh, outfits for the men and the hat and the curls and the women with their scarves and their skirts and on and on. Um, certain areas of Brooklyn and other parts of this country are very, very uh, populated by the Hasidic Jews who with their particular garb and their particular uh, rituals uh, are very zealous. Growing up not too far from where I lived in Albany was a very orthodox very orthodox uh, gathering in a house uh, on South on uh, New Scotland Avenue near South Main, and so orthodox that when you went into that environment, I was told I never went there. I would not be allowed as such. But if you went there, there is a there's a partition, there's a curtain. The men are separate from the women, and so they have the very very clear zealous uh, understanding of what they believe is the law and what they believe will make them righteous. When mother and dad went into assisted living, they ended up in a, a Jewish 
uh, kosher place, and the kitchen was kosher. And uh, it's a great place to go to eat if you're trying to lose weight. Uh, it's, <laughs> I ate there every night, never had any trouble with too many calories. Uh, that's, I was there for over almost a year. Never did find a meal I liked, but um, that's a personal preference. But uh, one day, mother ordered lunch and uh, it was delivered. And it turned out to be a cheese sandwich. And she didn't finish it. And uh, I came in that evening around five and I was going to go down and bring the evening meal. And mother said, honey, would you take the dish down to the kitchen? And I went with the dish into the kitchen about 5.05. They looked at the dish, they literally screamed, they said, get out of this kitchen immediately. I had brought a lunch consisting of dairy into the kitchen at night when they were serving meat. And they could not have meat and dairy in the same kitchen. They had to cleanse that kitchen, kitchen afterwards before they could have the meal. One time mother and I went to a nice kosher restaurant in New York City and sat down, and mother ordered, and the waiter said, that's fine. And then I ordered, and he said, that's not fine. You must go into the other room, because mother had ordered dairy, and I'd ordered meat. I said, hey, I'll change it, I'll have dairy. Let's not uh, be concerned about it. But their zeal. And it's not just the Jews, it's, you find this among Gentiles, you find this in, in religions, you find this without the religious. There are scrupulous attention to detail. Uh, I think this is righteous, and so therefore I'm going to do that. I don't mind cheating on my income tax, don't mind cheating on my wife, but I would never, ever think of doing anything abusive to an animal. And that's an attitude that some person might have. Or I don't cheat on my wife, but I will cheat on my taxes, uh, because my standards indicate that that's okay. So people have their own righteousness. Righteousness taught by their, their parents, their grandparents, schooling, reading, their own uh, devising. And so there's a lot of zeal going on in people trying to get to heaven uh, on their own way. Uh, people ringing your doorbell on Saturday mornings. Incidentally, you know, I've heard Christians say, I wish we had that kind of a zeal that the Jehovah's Witnesses have. Dear heart, if you had hanging over you what they do, you'd ring doorbells every single Saturday because that's how you get to heaven. That's their law. That's their rule. And um, so it goes. Two, two by two, the Mormons go out into the world to share their faith. Isn't that wonderful? They take two years off and do that. Have to. Have to. So uh, righteousness. Mormons will baptize for the dead. I'll be baptized for myself, and now I'm going to baptize for grandma and grandpa. Maybe they didn't get baptized. And I can bring them into the presence of God. So there's a lot of zeal going on out there. The important thing is, though, that it has to be according to God's revelation of righteousness. Verse 3, they being ignorant, still talking about Israel, they're ignorant of God's righteousness, what God requires. They seek to establish their own righteousness, and they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So it has to be one way, and Jesus himself said about that way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so he says here in verse 4, Christ is the end of the law, the goal of the law, the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So what is the standard that God requires for righteousness? It's not your dress. It's not the things you do. But it's your Faith in Jesus Christ. It's believing. It's trusting in Him. And incidentally, this matter of, of dress is not just for, for the Jews. The very first church I went to was very much involved in that. My wife and I were discussing that today uh, about a uh, so-called prophet who was part of this. Women could not cut their hair, could not wear makeup, could not wear jewelry, uh, could not wear slacks. And um, if you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sorry, you're going to hell because it was not in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, there are all sorts of rules and regulations and rituals, um, even among the Gentiles. So it has to be Christ, Jesus Christ, the end, the end of the law for righteousness. Righteousness is fulfilled in him 
as you believe in him. Verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. So if you want to try to be righteous by keeping the law, Moses says, the man who does these things shall live by them. So if you want to have a righteousness which is apart from Christ, you can try keeping all 613 laws of the Old Testament. Jesus did it. Nobody else did it, but he did. But the righteousness of faith is not going to be by keeping the law. Because James says, if you violate one law, you violate them all. So none of us can. A little baby, somewhere along the line, breaks the law, the law of sin. As soon as that baby is selfish, not selfless, and all babies are selfish, we all are, you've broken the law, so that's not going to work. You need the righteousness through Jesus Christ. But how do you get it? What do you do? Years ago, I had a friend who said to me, I want to find God. And I said to her, well... How are we going to do that? We tried going to an old church that I had gone to, and that didn't seem to make any sense. So we began to pray. We said, Lord, we want to find you. Don't know how to find you. Reveal yourself to us. And it wasn't very long thereafter that uh, he led us on a journey down south to reconcile with my real father, down in their biological father in Tennessee, then to Florida to see my brother, and then back up to Albany to go to a full gospel businessmen's meeting, and I found it through Jesus Christ. It had to be through him. Uh, keeping the law wouldn't do it. But you don't have to go all the way across country to find Jesus, do you? I didn't have to travel south uh, 1,100 miles and then back up north. You don't need to travel anywhere to find salvation. In fact, it's very close to you. Verse 6, the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. This is how you achieve God's righteousness by faith. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So if you're looking for Jesus Christ, you don't need to travel down to Florida. Don't need to go to heaven. Can't get to heaven anyway and come back and tell about it. And then you can't go down into the abyss, the abode of the dead, and come back and start working with that righteousness. So how are you going to find Jesus? Verse 8, what does it say? What does the Word say? The Word says, and here he's quoting from Deuteronomy, the Word is near you, this is the Word of faith, how to receive Jesus Christ and salvation. The Word is near you, how close is it? In your mouth. And in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Can't get any closer than that. Faith is in your word, and it's in your heart. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess, what does it mean to confess? to agree with, to say the same thing that God says. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, who do you confess to? Oh, there's been a lot of teaching that you've got to stand up in front of a large crowd and say, guess what, guys, I am a born-again believer, but I'm too afraid to do that. Is that what he's saying here? No. Confess means to say the same thing as God says. Who do you confess to? You confess to God. I agree with you, God. Now, we should confess to others. That's fine. But that's not a condition of salvation. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you agree with God and say so to him in whatever way you say it. And you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was raised from the dead, thereby accomplishing your righteousness and your salvation, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness. It's got to be in your heart, not just the mouth confession. For years, when I was a little boy, I'd sit down at the age of 10 and 12 and 14, and I would watch Billy Graham on television, sit on the floor, <clears throat> and he would have that altar call. 
And I would listen to him. I'd repeat what he had to say. I would cry. And I would say those words with my mouth. I would confess with my mouth Jesus as my Savior. But I wasn't saved. Because I didn't believe it in my heart. I was going to a church that taught that Jesus Christ was not the Savior. He was only a man. And that salvation came through me working out my salvation on my own. So I said the words, I confessed with my mouth, but I didn't believe in my heart that God had raised him from the dead and really had become my savior. And so, age 10, 12, 13, it would be 20 years later, 22 years later, before I would believe in my heart. In fact, the very day that I said the sinner's prayer, I went home that night and I said, Jesus, I got a problem. I've confessed that you are God, but I've been taught that you're not God. Show me that you are. And he opened my heart and I opened the word. And in John 1, 1, I read, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And I instantly believed it. That's when I was saved. And so you have to have both. You've got to have the mouth to confess to the Lord. You've got to have the heart to believe that God's raised him from the dead. So verse 10, with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Soteria. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Looking to Isaiah. When you believe in Christ, you're not going to be put to shame. Not going to be embarrassed. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. God sees us the same, Jew and Gentile. Anybody can come to him. And God will be rich towards those who call upon him for his salvation. And then he opens it right up, verse 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that scripture. That's so inclusive. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus, shall be saved. Now that's a great passage. Tremendous passage. The passage for salvation. Being born again, brought into the family of God. And I use it when I'm trying to bring someone to Christ and they're ready to pray. Then let's Confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus. Believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead and will be saved. But did you ever find more richness in something than you ever thought possible? That word saved, verse 9, is worth looking at. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You know what the word saved means? It's not the word soteria having to do with salvation and the family of God. Saved usually in the the Greek in the New Testament means to be healed physically. The woman with the issue of blood said, setting the point of contact, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be sozo is the Greek word, S-O-D-E-Z-O in our language. Sozo, I'll be saved, healed physically. So I did a complete word search one time on the word sozo. Almost always in the New Testament, it has to do with physical healing. This is kind of an exception here. It also means born again and brought in the family of God. Then I did some more research on sozo and I found, ooh, it has to do with prosperity. It has to do with healing of relationships because I realized that salvation is not just coming into the family of God but being preserved in every area of our lives. When a baby has life, it begins at birth, but that's hopefully not the end of life, only the beginning. What does the baby face? Hopefully, provision financially, emotionally, spiritually, relationship-wise. So God is saying here, I want you to use the word saved for your finances, for your relationships that are strained, for your emotional insecurity, for your spiritual development all of your life. So when was I saved? 
I was saved at a certain point in time years ago, but I'm also saved right now. When will I be saved again? The next moment, the next moment, I'll be preserved. What does a child and a, a young person hope from the family? For provision, continual, ongoing, until the child is able to take care of itself. And so God is saying, use that same scripture in verse 9 for your physical healing. How would that go, verse 9? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as your physical healer, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be healed physically. Let's take that verse for finances. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as your provider financially, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be provided for financially. Get the idea? Strained relationships. Certain people in the family aren't talking. How do you handle that? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as the reconciler, the one who brings peace and healing in relationships, etc., you're going to find healing in your relationship. So the word saved there, sozo, S-O-D-E-Z-O, is not just being born again, but provided for the whole journey until you're around the throne of God. And again, whoever wants to call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We talked about the doctrine of election. Have you been elected? Have you been chosen? If you don't know that you have, call upon him and he'll save you. And then you'll find out that you were called upon and elected all along. So that's how we get saved. That's how we're provided for. And righteousness comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not the end of it. If that's the case, if only one person receives it, that's the end of the Christianity after that person dies. God wants us to share the good news with others. So part two of our talk tonight is righteousness comes by preaching, not just by faith, but you've got to get out there and share that good news with others. People must preach the word, and people must hear the word, and then people must accept the word. And... Uh, you and I, I don't care how we came to the Lord, somebody shared faith with us. In my case, my brother, my sister-in-law, my mother, you've got your own story about who shared the word. Billy Graham, maybe early on on television, as I say, but you're going to find that there are a number of people probably involved with your salvation sharing that word, even billboards. You see more and more billboards uh, that talk about Jesus. There's one billboard that just says Jesus on it. Verse 14, people have to preach the word. How then shall they call on him? He says now, verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? If you don't believe in Jesus, you can't call on him. That's why I was a 13-year-old sitting there on the floor watching Billy Graham, and I was crying and saying the words, but I wasn't really calling on him because I didn't believe that he'd been raised from the dead. I didn't believe he was God the Son as well as the Son of God. So I couldn't call on him because I didn't believe. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So you can't be called and receive until you believe, and you can't believe unless you've heard about him. And how shall they hear without a preacher? You need to have a preacher. Now, a preacher is a, a guy with a black suit and a narrow black tie, right? And a big hooked nose and a crooked finger. No, that's not a preacher. Maybe some preachers are like that. The word preacher here means to share your faith. It's not somebody in the pulpit. It's not an office. It's not an official. Uh, it's not one of the fivefold or fourfold ministry. It means to any, somebody who shares with you. Your grandmother somebody at the water cooler, that person on television. And how shall they preach unless they're sent? So you need a preacher. You need someone to share the faith. How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are the feet 
of those who preach the gospel or share that gospel and they bring glad tidings of good things. So maybe you don't think you have beautiful feet. We concentrate a lot on our face and our midsection and what have you. How about beautiful feet? I don't mean going to a podiatrist or going to get your nails done, but are my feet taking the gospel to others? Are my feet being used to share the faith? But I don't feel qualified. It doesn't make any difference. You just go and God will provide the opportunity for you. One of the greatest examples I think of beautiful feet was in a case in the gas station. And uh, I was at the gas station and a car ahead of me, there were a couple of cars ahead, and one, one person got out and shared the faith with someone else and gave that person a tract. Prayed with that person, that person received Jesus. Got right out of the car, came right back to me and handed the tract and prayed. I knew the Lord already, but that's pretty fast. Just quickly sharing your faith. So you don't need to wait for the preacher to come on in, you be the preacher. You have the beautiful feet and you bring the good tidings of Jesus Christ. And that's how the early church really developed. They just went out and scattered and that same word uh, is just to, to share their faith. It really means to gossip. The idea is to gossip. Hey, have you heard about how great Jesus is? We ought to cut the gossip out about the negativity, about this and that, politicians and the economy and the world. Let's gossip about Jesus. Have you heard how great he is? Can I tell you a testimony about Jesus? Verse 16, so we need beautiful feet. But you know, when you take the good news to others, they don't always want to hear it, do they? But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So not everybody's going to believe your report. I've been shut down in my family. How about you? I don't want to hear any more about this Jesus or your church. I don't want to hear any more about it at all. I've been shut down. Well, verse 17 is one of the most famous verses about how to have faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we share the word, but Isaiah says not everybody's going to receive it. What do you do? You keep on sharing it. You keep on sharing it. Ever try to plant grass seed? Ever try to get grass to grow? Kind of a frustrating experience at times. What do you do? I've had patches that wouldn't receive seed. I dig it up, I put more dirt in there and still wasn't bringing forth seed. I get starter. I'd rough up that ground, I put starter in there, put seed in there and it still didn't work. So I said, oh, rats. Went up to see my friend Mike at Osborne Mill. For four or five bucks, you fork it over and say, give me some sod. <laughs> I'm tired of this. Lay the sod down, water it in six days. You just, it knits and you could just find. Sometimes it just doesn't go. You do the best you can. And you just keep sharing the word. But I say, verse 18, have they not heard? Yeah, most people have heard about the Lord in some way. Not all, but most certainly Israel had heard. He's talking about Israel primarily here. Israel was, was hearing from one prophet after another. Moses, Samuel, David, so many, many prophets. And just turning away and turning away. But he says here, quoting from the psalmist, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So we keep sharing the gospel. But I say, did not Israel... Did Israel not know? Wasn't Israel aware of God's salvation and righteousness through Jesus? Moses is the one who said in verse 19, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. So Israel, I'm going to make you jealous. I brought the gospel to you and you didn't want it. I'm going to take it then to those who are not a nation, not chosen by me, meaning the Gentiles. And I'm going to move you to anger by jealousy by having those who are, in your mind, foolish, receive the good news. 
And you watch when the Gentiles start to come to me and see how angry you're going to be. Verse 20, but Isaiah is very bold. And Isaiah is writing 750 years before Christ, 2,700 years ago for us. I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. So God really revealed himself to Israel. Israel said for the most part, no, no thank you, and still does. But he said, I will go to others out there on the highways and the byways and find somebody who will. And I was found by those who did not seek me. The, the Gentiles weren't seeking me, but I revealed myself and they accepted me in many cases. I was made manifest or declared to those who did not ask for me. Again, talking about the Gentiles. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I have reached out to you and reached out to you and you just are not receiving me. And again, that's the testimony today, even in Israel and even among most of the Jews that I've known. And I was raised, as I say, by an Orthodox Jew, believed by many to be Jewish, even though I wasn't, and lived very much in a Jewish world. And for the most part, they did not and do not receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Some of the rabbis got upset with Dad because he was one of the city court judges in Albany. And historically in Albany, you had three judges. Kind of starts off like a bad joke. There were three judges in Albany. One was Catholic, one was Protestant, one was Jewish. It was true. And Dad was chosen as the Jewish judge. But he became a born-again Christian. And the rabbis were upset because they had lost their Jewish judge who'd become this Christian. And they were very, very, they wouldn't even talk to him in some cases. Wouldn't even talk to him. And here he was a prominent judge and a very loving man. But he wasn't their Jewish judge. So God's reaching out his hand, but they're still disobedient. But uh, verse chapter 11 is going to tell us the good news next week that not all of them are going to reject the Lord. There'll still be some who will be coming to Jesus. And there are Jews who come to the Lord all the time, individual Jews. And Israel itself will be taken into the tribulation, will be persecuted by the Antichrist, and there will be those who will be purified, will turn to the Messiah in the tribulation and be allowed to enter in to the millennium. And the Lord is going to then rule through Israel. And Israel is going to become the jewel in the Lord's crown. And uh, Israel is going to be governed by the Lord Jesus, but with the apostles very much helping him to rule that particular country. And she'll become an evangelist really to the world at that time to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So for today, we have this wonderful news of righteousness, but it is not going to be achieved by our own works, our own rites, R-I-T-E-S, our rituals, not by any group that we belong to or any good deeds that we do because the righteousness of man, Isaiah said, is like filthy rags before God and he will not allow it. Consequently, we have to come God's way, bend the knee, and acknowledge I'm a sinner, and the only way I can receive righteousness is by trusting in Jesus Christ that he bore my sins on the cross and he was raised again for my justification. And Paul tells that to the Roman church in chapter 4. He was, raised, he was uh, offered up because of our iniquities, our sins, our trespasses, and he was raised up to declare that we are righteous by trusting in him. So I think the only way to end this message is to give you the opportunity, especially those watching by television, by uh, YouTube, different parts of the world, uh, radio, whatever method you're using here, let's be sure of our salvation. You have nothing to lose but your sins and everything to gain. Not only eternal life and a place in heaven with the Lord, but provision right now protection financially and in relationships and spiritually in every other way. So how do we do it? 
if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So let's do it. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this message and the clarity that is given by the Apostle Paul, the simplicity of it. We don't need to travel to Florida to find you, don't have to research books to find you, don't have to fast and put on sackcloth and ashes. What we do is realize that you're closer than the breath that we breathe. You're in our mouth, you're in our heart. Lord Jesus, with our mouth, we confess that you are Lord. And we confess you as our Lord, personally. We also, Lord, believe in our hearts that God has raised you from the dead, thereby affirming the righteousness that is available to us. God accepted your sacrifice in our place, cleansed us from sin because of your paying the price for sin. So we believe in our hearts that you've been raised from the dead. So Lord, we're going to ask you to save us now. We're going to ask you to save us and bring us into the family of God, cleanse us and, and let your wonderful life and word work through our lives to take us to a new place with you and take us to others to share that good news as well. And Lord, for those who are hurting physically, we are saved, sozo. We are saved through you, Lord Jesus. For those who are hurting financially, we are provided for through you. For those who are hurting in relationships, we're again finding our peace and our healing through you. For those who are hurting emotionally, depressed and fearful, anxious, again, Lord, be our Savior. If I can but touch the hem of your garment, I shall be sozoed, I'll be saved. Thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. And amen.